if you're watching online, we want to bless you too. Come and worship with us. Come and experience God's presence with us. Right. Shall we worship him? Yeah. We've got some exciting things this morning. Why don't you stand and uh, find yourself some space. And um, I want you to shake off all of that stuff from when you came in. Okay? Because it's, that's not coming in here this morning. We're coming in here to get changed by his presence this morning. So, Father, we thank you for your presence here this morning. We thank you that this is your house and you can do whatever you like in this house. Holy Spirit, we welcome you. We worship you. You are wonderful in this place. And uh, we bless you, Lord. We bless you to come and work amongst us here in this place this morning. Amen. We welcome you.
As we sing this song this morning, freedom is yours. I need to get up higher. Freedom is yours this morning. It's your portion, it's your inheritance. I don't know what's been happening in your week, but I declare over you freedom. Find some space, express yourself, because it's yours. All of it. Let's talk about our finances, let's talk about our jobs, let's talk all of it. It's all yours. You're free this morning. It's yours.
just want to speak to any grave places that you have left in you. You know, in John 10:10, 10, 10, it says the spirit, um, the thief comes to kill, to steal, and to destroy. But Jesus came to bring us abundant life. And so I just want to speak to any of those places where it feels like you're living in the grave of your fullness of life. And even now, just hold open your hands. I believe that this is a place of exchange. If you're holding something which has been destroying you or keeping you bound in unforgiveness or not allowing you to live in the fullness, I see hands all across this room. Spirit of God, we thank you that you are coming in freedom and you are doing a divine exchange, not just in this moment right now, but for the rest of eternity. So we say, come Lord Jesus, would you come and do what we are singing in each of our lives? We shake off that place of death where there's been killing, stealing and destroying and step into life and all of its abundance. Amen. Let's give him a praise as we keep worshiping this song. We don't normally do this, but I just have a sense as we started worship that a presence of heaven, angels itself, started moving in on this side right here in front of Margaret and Tom. And I, I asked the Lord, what are they doing? And I just felt that they were angels ascending and descending. And they were dancing and they were praising. And at that moment in the worship, there wasn't the joy that's here right now. Can you feel the joy here right now? At that moment, the joy wasn't there. And I said, God, what's happening? He said, wait and see. And the joy is breaking out. And I want to just give you an opportunity to respond to Tom's word, to Anna's word. As Jude's going to continue to sing this, this is a new song. You set me free. He paid it all for me. Just come. If you need God to lift grave clothes off you, if you need God to shift things, just come and stand here at the front because the angels are dancing now within mankind, reaching up to heaven. So let's break this place open. This is the kingdom of God on earth. This is the place His glory dwells. This is the house of God. Don't hold back.
my fire of cleansing and purification of all aspects of society. I am confident that I have a people, my remnant of this day, who will stand together for my nation, my kingdom, to be exalted and for me to be known as the Lord in heaven and on earth. Great is the glory I will unveil through you and among you. My
Yes, you are Lord of all, Jesus. Just lift your hands. Um, I've been talking with Tom, and we just have a sense from Psalm 46 where it says that there is a river whose streams make glad the city of our God. And as we've been worshiping, I felt the river of God moving through us. And everyone who's responded, I want to release the scripture over you. You haven't just come to an altar or a carpet and a building in Dudley, but you've come to the throne of God. And this is what he says over you. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave you all your sins. And having canceled the charge which stood against us and condemned us, consisting of um, decrees that had made against you, he has nailed it to the cross. And now he has disarmed the powers and the authorities. He has made a spectacle, spectacle over them, triumphing over them through the cross. Just let's sing this one more time. The bridge of the song, Jude, it's so good. So let your name be lifted higher. Lift him higher. Lift him higher in this place. Lift him higher over the decrees. Lift him higher over the things that are being thrown aside. So let your name be lifted higher. Be lifted higher. Be lifted higher. Nothing can hold you back because he has the highest name. He has the greatest name. He has the strongest name. He has the only name by which we're saved. this morning. Praise for what he has to. Praise for what he's gonna do. Praise for his presence in this place. We praise you, Jesus, for your great power. Go on, just turn to someone, bless them. We filled up since worship started. Tell them it's so good to see you. You can get ready to make your way to your seats. Tom's gonna come up and lead us in an offering this morning. But take a minute, just bless someone. There's so many visitors here. You're so welcome. It's so good to have you here at church this morning. You came to the right place for God to touch you. God's pretty good, isn't he? Yeah, he is. He is. Yeah, thank you, Lord, for what you're doing amongst us. You know, if this is your first time here, um, this is us. This is how we do and worship God. Um, God has done so much for us. We want you to know that. He's done so much for you. So, um, yeah. Welcome again this morning. I know that there's some, some visitors here. We've got some, we're going to be praying for Sandy as it's Sandy's last day. Last day. She's not really. She's always going to be part of the family, Sandy. It, I know. It feels like school, doesn't it? Um, but, um. Before that, I really want to just share as we come and give this morning, I want to encourage you as you come and give. You know, um, the, the, the phrase, the, the line, the, the word that God put in my heart this morning is, freely as you've received, freely give. You know, this morning you've freely given. There is, there is a river that runs from heaven and its streams make us glad. That's in Psalm 46. You can meditate that all week. Okay, but I was I was um, thinking about this this morning, and um, everything that we have is given from above. John the Baptist said that in John three. Um, sorry, so yeah, in John three, and um, I, I wanted to share this because sometimes we can feel like we can hold on to things, and I believe that there's more freedom here for us this morning. 
I believe that. I believe in the way that we give our offering. We can break through into something more. I know that in my own personal life. You know, this, this week I've been given a new job. Hallelujah. Woo! The new jobs. Yeah, and comes with, you know, I've got to understand, though, that that has been given to me. I haven't earned it. And this is, a, this is an interesting concept I'm not going to go into fully right now. But everything that I have, opportunities, jobs, uh, resources, relationships around us, and it, is, it is all being given to us from our Father in heaven. Why? Because he loves you. You don't have to earn your way in. But you know what? Sometimes there is a point where we think we, when it's not going to come again, so I've got to hold on to it real tight, really tight. And so at that point, I'm going to be staying wealthy. I'm going to be staying whole. I'm going to be, it's a lie. It's a lie. And in Joshua, and I want to share this, I don't want to go into too deeply, but in, in Joshua 6, chapter 6 and 7, it talks about a time where the people of Israel came into their promised land, okay? They had an inheritance that God had promised to them. And I believe that that is relevant for us as a family in this place. God is bringing us into something new and he's, he's giving us this land and it's full of milk and honey. It is. It's going to be good boys and, <laughs> boys and girls. I was, in, I was doing kids church. I was doing kids church. You see that? I transitioned. Come into this room. And um, <laughs> I'm a child of God. Um, so, so listen, I want you to understand this. Because there was a moment where God said, do this, and Jericho, the first city of this land, will be yours. It will be yours. You'll conquer it. So they did what was needed to be done. But all of the, the treasure, all of the gold and the silver, that was meant for the Lord. Right? And there was one guy, his name was Achan, he said, you know what, this looks really good. I see a Gucci suit, and that is mine. He said, he said, I saw a garment from Babylon, silver and gold, and he took it, dug a hole, and put it in the ground. And he was hiding it. He was trying to hold on to it. But as we've discovered this morning, there is a river. A river flows. It, it, it flows through us into, <laughs> and, and we take part in the kingdom in doing it. Does that make sense? So this vibrated in my mind as I was reading that. And, and where else does it say where he took something and hid it and didn't let it multiply? It's in the Gospels where it talks about the, the, the miners, where the talents. What I have, I've got to give it away. I've got to see it be fruitful. The same man, I mean, this, this happens and this spirit is active from the dawn of time, from Cain and Abel, right until now. And we can embrace this, this holding on this tightness to our, our material wealth, if we like, we can have it. We won't see much fruit though. There is a river and I want you to flow with it this morning because when Zacchaeus, he was a man like that. He, he ripped people off because he took what he could for himself and it brought him no joy. There was no life in his life. Jesus comes to his house and it, Jesus himself said, salvation has come to this house. Why? Because he gave back. He gave half what he had to the poor. It, this is, and then that's the breaking of the dam, you see. He gave what he could to the poor. What it, half of what he had to the poor. And he restored to those who he mistreated four times as much. You see, what happened at that point? The river had started to flow. Salvation had come to this house. Does that make sense? I want salvation to overflow in this place. Because it does say, give and it will be given. Press down. So it doesn't come back the same. <laughs> it doesn't come back. It multiplies. We give. It gets given back to us. Press down, shaken together like a cocktail. So much so it pours over our laps. That's for us this morning. So, sorry, I went on. I want you to be, uh, you, you know, you know, We've got to understand God is doing something new amongst us. And one of the signs is generosity. Whenever God breaks out, however he does it, it is always new. But the character and the nature of God is that he is so generous. 
whatever, whatever. It's about emotion. You've got to know the nature of God. You've got to know who you're following. This morning, let us flow with the river. Let us come and give. There's ways in the backs of your chairs. You can pay online. You know, I know we're going to worship. <laughs> but come, let us give this morning freely, just as we've received. Father, as we've given this, this morning, I ask for that, that spirit, <laughs> that same spirit that rises Christ, Christ Jesus from the dead that dwells in us. I ask that you would pour out over us, press it down to pour it out over our laps this morning. I ask, Father, that we would see multiplication, that we would see fruitfulness in our lives. Thank you, Lord. We bless you, Lord. You're a good God to us. Oh, we're grateful that we, we have been and we've been allowed to enter into your presence this morning. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Well, listen, I don't really want to move from this place. This, this presence, we can bring it in. We can say yes, Lord, to it, okay? Because we're going to sit down and we're going to do some other things, but I don't want you to lose this. This is us taking what God's done with us on the way, okay? Father, I want you to teach us this morning. I want you, us to be led by you, Holy Spirit. Mm. Thank you, Lord. I'm grateful that I know you. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Yeah. Good conclusion, isn't it? Amen. If someone says amen, you know what to do, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Again, I want to welcome you online, if I haven't said that already. Um, before 
Right, we're going to pray for Sandy in a second. Yeah, which I'm really excited about. Kids are going out. Why don't we bless the kids as they're going out? Oh, after Sandy. Okay, all right. So, um, what I want you to... I just want to pay attention. These, are going to, these leaflets are on your chairs. I want you to have a look at them, guys. Okay? Everybody see these? They're probably on the... It can be just explained to you. You don't have to have too many questions there. Okay, so on the 8th, that's this Friday, we got Gather the Girls, 7 p.m. Got some ladies in this room who want to go? Good. You're welcome, ladies. No men allowed. Um, okay, so on next Sunday, we've got Mother's Day. Good reminder for myself. I need to get a card. Flowers. Yeah, mums. Chocolates. Oh, and the rest. Good. I'm pleased. It's good. Right. Sandy, come on. I've got something. Okay, okay. Come on. You're going to have to receive. Round of applause for Sandy. Trevor and Sharon really wanted to be here as well, and they've sent a video, so we'll watch that. And then we've got our, pre um, our leadership team wanted to come around and bless and prophesy over you. And I've got a story too, but let's, let's see the video first, and then we'll go into um, what I wanted to say. Let's go and make sure we can see it. here Sandy. Um, so gathered with us today there were friends that celebrate you to bless you into this next season um, and I know some of your stories already been alluded to but the journey from Toronto to here to serving revival to serving Jesus to being part of our staff teams pastoral teams ministry teams prophetic teams and um, the, we just want to thank you for the gift that you've been personally and to the family and the church and the ministry here in the United States is. And I know that you have hundreds of maybe thousands now of patients and people all across the Dudley Borough and beyond at the other hospitals where you've sat with people in some dark moments and held their hand and sat with them and offered the hope of God. And I just want to thank you for all the women, the children, the men that you have poured into, how you've honed your life upon the call of God that he has put first in you. And there's two things, two gifts that we wanted to give you. Ryan, do you want to just come and um, get the sure. first one? It's in the, the flowery bag. The first one, remind, I won't ruin the present. There's nothing ruined. It's a jar. And uh, it could have a better word. But what I, the verse I want to give you is from 2 Kings 4, 
And it talks about somebody who, ha- who said, I've got nothing except for a small jar to you. Um, a prophet came up to this woman in uh, 2 Kings 4 and said, go around, ask all your neighbors for empty jars. Don't ask for a few. Go inside, shut the door behind you, pour oil into all the jars and set each one aside until it's full. Then uh, bring another, bring another. And when there was no jars left, the oil stopped flowing. And then I, I just sense that there's a, such a rich resource that the Lord has for you in his presence, but also that as you yourself office and this emerging season, so they go from, I had to write them down, Ryan probably knows them off by heart, egg to a tadpole to a caterpillar to flying. And so they go from a stage of being in water to going on the ground to flying. And we released you to fly. It is such a picture that he will always fill you with oil of his presence and you will fly and soar across the seas, land. Pray. Do you want to say something, Sandy? I cannot take these things from you. Thank you. I have something prepared if that's okay. That's fine, Sandy. If I start preaching about it, though, okay. Um, The Lord has just really showed me a lot from the book of Acts, and um, I had a dream about the book of Acts. I know I'm returning to Canada, and it's about the acts of um, uh, the acts of uh, of what God wants to do, and I just want to. Pay attention to Acts 4.13, where it said, Now when the officials saw the boldness and bravery, I want you to receive this today, the boldness and bravery of Peter and John, the officials were amazed. They knew that these two apostles were only ordinary men and not well educated. They were astonished. The officials were certain and recognized that these men had been with Jesus. Yeah. So that is the key, is to be with Jesus, to be with the Holy Spirit and fire, which is what Revival Fires is all about. It's about that revival of the angels ascending and descending, getting our hearts sorted out, getting strengthened, and then being filled with the Holy Spirit and the fiery roar of the Lion of Judah who breaks every chain. And I just, my prayer for you is that you will go out into your community and that you will bless those neighbors and people in your workplace wherever you go. And I just want to thank Alan and Gail coming from Wales, Chrissy, Poppy and Judah coming all the way from up north. Thank you for coming today. All right. And also Marcia. I know you're staying in London, but you've been such a great part of the fellowship. And we want to just acknowledge you as well this morning as we, as we send Sandy off with such blessings. Why don't you come down here? Church, if you want to stand with us, stand with us. Stretch your hands out. This is a bittersweet moment. It's, it's sad because we are saying goodbye for now to a dear friend, a dear sister, someone who's part of the body. But we also know, as you've heard from Trevor and Sharon, as you've heard from Anna, that this is a season where you are going to fly. And so, Lord, we want to bless Sandy from this house. We want to bless her for the next steps. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you have all of our times in your hands. And we thank you, Lord Jesus, that even as it says in Ruth 2, verse 15, that you've let handfuls of purpose behind for us to do your good works, for us to find. And we pray, even as you go to Canada, Sandy, that it would be finding the good works that God has got for you. And we prophesy that you aren't returning the same even as you left. But you are so loaded and so full of skills and experience, of giftings and anointing, of teaching and impartation. And we thank you for the handful of purpose even waiting for you, Sandy, in Canada. And so we anoint you in the name of Jesus. We ask for the fire of the Holy Spirit. We love your passion, Sandy. For that roar even that you've released, we ask for that roar to go with you, that he would guide every step, every connection, and every relationship. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Sunday, when I I was um, praying for you this morning, God reminded me that geology tells us that North America and Europe were once one continent. Over millions of years, they've drifted apart, but they are one continent. And I just feel God saying, 
This is a continuation of what you've been drawing in. There's no break, there's no returning, there's no withdrawing. You are continuing. It's almost like you're taking one j just small step over to Canada and everything. Uh, you're, you're walking into his promises um, again. And the word that I had for you particularly was fullness. I just see apple trees just laden with fruit. I don't know if I've seen trees like this in your mum's garden, but um, you know, absolutely, you know, almost boughs breaking wow. with the fruit that you're going to walk into. So we bless you to walk in fullness in this season. Yeah. Uh, first of all, for the church, if you don't know Sandy, she's an incredible person. And I am so grateful to have met her and to have been in this church in that overlap. And if you haven't, I'm sorry you've missed out. However, she has deposited so much stuff in this church. What most of you are standing in is because of Sandy. I mean, obviously lots of other people, but Sandy is a key part of that. So and Sandy, I just want to honor you in that. Uh, I just bless you. I say thank you so much for your heart, for the fact that you've kept your heart soft as well, clean and clear. I see like this open garden. And actually when there was opportunity for thorns to grow in, you actively chose to cut them down. You are not just a warrior, but as in for, our, for the nations, or, but even in terms of your own heart and your own life you have chose to be active in making sure that the Lord has space in your life you have you were such a proactive person and I just bless that I want to read over you again Sandy um, Isaiah 61 not all of it but just from Grant just from uh, verse 3 um, just verse 3 uh, Sandy you grant consolation and joy to those who mourn in Zion you're, you have given and you give them an ornament, a garland, a diadem of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, the garment expresses of praise instead of a heavy burden and failing spirit. And this is the part that really resonated, that they may be called oaks of righteousness. And I bless the people that you've already spoken into and poured this into before, that they're growing as oaks of righteousness. And I bless those in the future and in Canada who you are calling up and, and calling into that purpose of an oak of righteousness for the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. And I say that over you as well, that you are an oak of righteousness, Sandy, for the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. And I bless that in this new season in the name of Jesus. Amen. You know, Sandy, um, it is a blessing to have known you. Like what I'm, I don't want to repeat everything that Lumi just said, but um, uh, you are an instrumental person in my life who has allowed me to hear God's voice. You, you've taught me the way that you know about hearing God's voice, and it has shaped and created my own life. And um, I just want to thank you. I get that. I get that. So... I, I believe, Sandy, from this point on, it's like you, I feel that you are like a missionary as you are sent from Ireland to the UK. You're going like St. Patrick back to Canada, and you've got your staff in your hand, you've got your cloak over your shoulders, and you are there to, to pioneer a way where there is no way. You are there to set the captives free. <laughs> Hallelujah. You're there to, to bind up the brokenhearted. And you've got your staff in your hand, and you will see, you will see the, the way open and community surround you. There, there is going to be, you won't have to try, but people will gather around you because Christ has been lifted up within you. And I ask, Lord, that you would shower her, cover her, let it be a canopy over her of your glory, that wherever she goes, people will come and know the gospel. I, I bless you, Sandy. I bless your eyes. I bless your heart. I ask, Father, that you would give her the aid of ministering spirits, those angels who do your bidding, that they would strengthen her in the works of her hands. Sandy, we bless you. We bless you in this place. Amen. Amen. Would you give one more hand just of gratitude? We bless you, Sandy. All right, um, children, we want to bless you too as you go out to your Sunday morning plan. If you run on over to Sarah at the side doors there, why don't you just um, bless them, church? As they run past you, give them a high five. Yeah, bless them with a clap. What's it with clapping? Well, it's a sound of gratitude, of praise. And Lord, we praise you for this generation. We ask that you would meet them today. 
We thank you for times of encounter. We thank you that you are going to bless them this morning. And so let them have the best time ever. Amen. All right, kids. See you on the other side. Little secret, it's going to be really fun in here too. Okay, adults, um, where's Sandy? She's still there. At the end of the meeting this morning, we also got cake and coffee, and we invite you all to stay, to, to thank Sandy, to spend some time with her. So it's, we've loaded her up right now in the spirit with what God is going to be doing as he moves with you back to Canada, as he moves you with him back to Canada. Uh, and let's also enjoy the fellowship and the time that we have together. Amen. All right, get your Bibles out. I've got a word that I want to bring and turn with me, please, to the book of Luke. Come on, let me see your Bible. I, I love worship because it's loud, and I don't want you to get too quiet. There we go. I see your Bible. Some of you waving your phones at me. That works. That works too, just as long as you also hashtag Revival Fires. Share everything, please. Uh, for those of you watching on Facebook, thank you for joining us. YouTube's got a bit of an issue, but we will fix it. So get your Bibles, turn with us to the book of Luke, and we're going to be in chapter 22. I believe that the Lord is just dovetailing everything that's happening in this meeting today. You know, one of the things that we call uh, the time that we spend together is a meeting. It's not just a service it's a meeting because we are here to meet with God, and he's got a journey, and a journey has a beginning, a middle, and an end, and he's been tracking it with us, and he's got gifts um, and life to pour into your heart. And over the couple, last couple of weeks, we've had, we've had so much going on in church life, haven't we? We've had offerings for nations. We've had sending people. We've had um, people going on teaching and on school training, and, and there's just been so many different parts, and I was really cautious for today that we didn't just have another part where we were adding communion at the end of a preach or trying to fit all these things in. And I really want to take you on a teaching as to why it's so important what we're doing, what we're coming to do as a church when we take communion, when you remember. And as I'm speaking, Tom, do you mind just getting, the, getting it set? Maybe Terry help. But the one table right in the middle and the two tables on the side. I just want to set the scene a little bit because what we have been invited into even though we have been so privileged to put into Sandy's future, God has got something for your future today. Even though there might have been some of you who were ready to have freedom as the, as the God in Zephaniah, he dances and he spins over us. And you responded right here this morning because you knew that God was going to set you free from something. But he, and God will do that. But he's got a message for you, for every single one of you gathered today, for visitors, people, maybe this is your first time. Some of you have never been to church before. Some of you might have been to church in the past and Life has happened and things have brought you away and you find yourself here today back in church. It's so good to have you and I want you to know that God has got a word just for you. So we're going to be talking about the power of communion. God's got us on a journey of restoring things and I want you to see today how as we acknowledge, as we remember, as we give thanks to God for what he did in sending his son Jesus to die on a cross for us, releases so much power in our lives. Are you ready? Luke 22, let's read from verse 14. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks. Now say, gave thanks. Come on, shout it out. Gave thanks. We give you thanks, Lord Jesus. And he said, take this, divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And then he took the bread, gave thanks, and he broke it, and he gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. And so I want to speak today about the power of communion and why we need to remember. The reason we need to remember is because things get lost. Things get forgotten and things get stolen. 
And God wants us to be in a place where we continue our remembering what he's done for us and what he's got lined up for us. So the first thing I want to look at, restoring what has been lost. The first thing that can come and can get us lost is is these two words I'm going to use. The one word is legalism, and the other word is liberalism. I've got a number of L words lining up in my mind. Now, I want you to imagine this. On a road, there are gullies or ruts either side of a road. Maybe not so much in the town, but there's definitely drains. If you drive out into the countryside, you'll see as you're driving down a road, there is a a dip on either side of the road. Now, where's the safest place as you're driving? Right in the road. Someone said in the middle. Yes, until there's oncoming traffic. (laughs) But you're right. The middle of the road is the safest place. But what can tend to happen is that we can be drawn to to two edges of the road. And the one side of that road can be called legalism, religion where we do things in our own strength, where we do things out of tradition, where we do things because we don't always know why, but it's something that was told that we should do. And sometimes we can take communion religiously, and that causes us to lose things. Let me tell you, religion is a place where the power of God loses its effectiveness in our lives because we do it in our own strength, or we do it because we don't really know what we're doing. The other thing that can happen is that liberalism can step into our lives. And that's like the gutter or the rut on the other side of the road. Sometimes we can veer towards legalism. Sometimes we can veer towards liberalism. And we can come to a day like today and say, oh, you know, it's the blood. Jesus' grace has done everything for me. I can take this body and cup and bread and, and blood and just enjoy it because of his grace. And he's done everything for me. And, but we don't actually stop. And discern the body of Christ and think about, how, actually, how have I been living this week? Yeah. You see, grace is the very thing that empowers us to come and take communion. But what we can do is we can abuse grace. We can live under hyper grace and we can fall on the other side of the road. And that's called liberalism. The scripture actually uses a word based out of license. It's called licentiousness. You don't have to say that to your neighbor. But the book of Jude in verse 4 says this, certain individuals have secretly slipped in among you. They are ungodly people who pervert the grace of God for and turn license for immorality. They give you a license. And so also we can come and we can think, I, you know, I'm a Christian. God saved me. I can do anything. Anything is profitable. There was a church in the Bible called the Corinthian church. You can say that to your neighbor. Don't be a Corinthian church today. Some of you need to find a neighbor to sit next to. You see, the Corinthian church had fallen into liberalism. They came and they didn't give thought about the body of Christ that they were celebrating. They didn't give thought about it. And Paul actually wrote to them very strongly and said, I have nothing to praise you on this matter. In fact, because you don't discern the body, some of you have even fallen sick and have died. I want this communion meal, this table that has been prepared for us that we come to today to actually release health into your bodies, to release life into your bodies. That is what Jesus went to the cross for. But if we fall into liberalism, we're too liberal with the things we need to actually stop and give thought and attention to, we can get lost. Do you know what the difference is? We're talking about the ruts either side of the road. Do you know what the difference is between a grave and a rut? It's only a couple of feet deep. And sometimes we can be so caught in ruts that we actually turn them into graves. And we die in the very thing that God has set for us for life. I found out about ruts the hard way. When I first moved to England, I was working for a charity called Salt Mine Trust. And you guys are going to love this. Do you know what my first task was? I, I came to the UK with a guitar in one hand, a suitcase in the other, turned up at a train station, saw Dudley Castle, thought, have I gone back in time? Like, what is this place I've come to? And God, God had arranged for me to work at a Christian performing arts theater company. And I thought I was going to be playing my guitar on stages all over the place. But do you know the first task they gave me was a sponsored rickshaw drive. Um, anyone been to India? Anyone in India here? Rickshaws, they're like these motorized um, tut-tuts, motorized electric 
um, electric motorbike, mo- motorcycles that have got a seat that you can put like a couple of passengers and they're three wheels. And they've got a little bit of a, a cover over the top. So you can zip around and collect people. So one guy had the fantastic idea. Uh, Dave Pope, he is an amazing leader and I thank him for all that he's done in my life. He, he imported two rickshaws over from India to raise money to send back to India, right? And the plan was a sponsored rickshaw drive. So get, get some young upstarts. Oh, is there a new guy called Ryan from Zimbabwe? He'll be perfect for that job. What you're gonna do is you're gonna travel from Dudley all the way down to Swansea, Wales, all the way down to Land's End in um, Cornwall, all the way along the south coast, all the way up to Kent, all the way somehow across the Thames. Let me tell you, that was scary. And then all the way back to Dudley. And we're gonna ask, we're gonna get people to sponsor them to drive certain legs. Okay. So I was, I had seen after being in England for about three months, I'd seen more of the UK than I had seen of the whole of Zimbabwe in my entire life <laughs> through the back of a rickshaw. So we, we were somewhere on the south coast. Um, we were weeks into this project, and I, I had put my life on the line, put my life in the hands of strangers every single day because they would turn up and they didn't know how to drive a rickshaw. There was a weird clutch on your foot and there was a weird uh, like brake gear change on your hand. And we'd have to teach them how to drive a rickshaw. And then they'd have to drive about 20 to 50 miles with me in the car for safety. Fortunately, there was a safety car behind. Anyone like Formula One? A safety car, you know. I was... So often we would, I would be training these guys and they would forget where the brakes were and we would roll into oncoming traffic. And the Lord just kept me alive because I was going to meet and marry the love of my life, Anna. Anyway, one day I'm sat in the safety car, driving behind uh, Paul, who's driving the rickshaw. And it was weeks into this, we've done miles and miles and miles. And we're on a road with ruts either side of the road. And I see him, the road veers to the right. And for some reason, he decides to go straight. And this little rickshaw bounces off the road and gets stuck wheel first in a rut. It was then that I learned ruts can become graves very, very easy. And what God doesn't want to do, he wants to get us out of the ruts. You know, there might be some of you that you've been going through season after season and cycle after cycle. I know it's you because you came here to respond to what the angels of God, the power of heaven wanted to do in your life. And we can get stuck in those ruts and we can get stuck in those seasons. And I want you to know that there is power right here in the blood of Jesus to overcome everything. There is power through the cross of Jesus Christ. It is accessible. He wants to take us out of legalism. He wants to stop robbing the power that the cross has in our lives. He wants to take us out from the shadows and into the reality. You see, for thousands and thousands of years, uh, let, me just, let me just share this to you because I think it's amazing. I just read to you from Luke 22, right? And Jesus was with his disciples sitting down and they were going through a meal. And if you keep reading, it says that, and then they sang a song. Do you know what song they sang at the end of that meal? It was straight out of Psalm 118. This was a Passover meal. And what they would do at the Passover is they would sing words that are in our scriptures. You see, we, we have them all put together sometimes and we just think it's really great to spend every day in the word and discover it as it, and it is. But there's a cultural um, depth that we can get when we put it all together. So what they would do in Jesus' day is while they were having that meal, they would actually sing songs. And the songs were sung from Psalm 113 through to Psalm 118. And what would happen in these Psalms, I don't have time this morning, but go away and read them. It prophesies about the salvation and the redeeming blood. It talks about tying a sacrifice to the horns of the altar. It talks about a king coming in the name of the Lord. It talks about um, Hosanna and the son of David. And this had all happened. This had all unfolded before the disciples in the very moment. And they were singing about it. See, what they were doing, they were living in the shadow of things to come. And they were prophesying about it and they were speaking about it, whether it was through story, whether it was through scripture, whether it was through taking a meal and eating together. God was telling them the story of redemption, but it was a shadow. But there came a moment where what they were singing about began to unfold before their very eyes. And that is the moment that you and I get to live in. That's the moment that we live in. We don't get to live in the shadow anymore. Amen. Hallelujah. We get to live in the fullness. We get to live in the freedom. We aren't just taking a cup 
as they did in Luke 22 at Passover, that's prophesying about one day a sacrifice will come where one sacrifice will be enough to cover, to change, will be enough to take the decrees against you and nail them to the cross. We live in the fullness of Jesus Christ who went for the cross once and for all and has set aside all of the sin in our lives, has made a way and opened a way. And so what are the, some of the things that can be lost sometimes is salvation. We were lost, but now we are found. We were dead, but now we are alive. Let us celebrate this sacrifice that God has done. And I want you to know that sometimes as we go through our Christian lives, we can lose things in our Christian lives. We can lose the joy. The Bible talks about the joy of salvation. We can lose the wonder the wonder of this cup, the wonder of our relationship, the wonder of the nearness that he's called you to. We can lose the childlike faith. If you feel that you've come to a place where things are lost in your lives, these tables that have been positioned for us this morning, what they are, they're not just the shadow anymore, but they're the fulfillment of Psalm 23. And what does it say there? It says, he prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. What was dead can come to life because of the blood of Jesus Christ in your life today. What was lost can be found because of the blood of Jesus Christ. And I've talked about things that are lost through legalism, things that are lost through liberalism, but also the only, and none of that as a hindrance as we come to partake of it this morning. The only thing that could ever be a hindrance is if you haven't given your life to Jesus Christ. And today can be a day where you step in and lay your life down before him and find salvation. That scripture that I was quoting is from Luke chapter 15. It's been one of the scriptures that we're really believing God is going to do for this year of 2024. Because what is he doing in 2024? He is going to restore and the things that he's restoring, as it said in Luke 15, 24, is this. My son was dead, but now he is alive. He was lost, but now he is found. Friends, you don't need to be lost a minute longer. You don't need to be dead a minute longer. There is available to us today the goodness of God. See, this is the great cost that Jesus paid for my salvation. He lost his life to save mine. He gave up. He lost his dignity for my worth. He lost his control for my freedom. He lost his very blood for my life. This is what we do as we come to remember. Sometimes also we have to remember because things have been forgotten. Have you ever forgotten anything important? Have you ever forgotten a pin number perhaps? Let me stick with this example of a PIN number because here is what is available to us. If we have lost our PIN number, and I'll tell you a story in a minute about losing a very important PIN number. If we've lost our PIN number, we can't access what is already ours in the bank. We could go to the hole in the wall, the ATM, we could put our card in, and we can put the wrong numbers in. And what is ours by name, what is ours by nature, what is ours by right, will not be be ejected out of that wall into our lives because we've got the pin number wrong. Does that make sense? God wants you to know that even as we come and take the communion, we can, we're coming to a place where we are remembering the very access that we have to Him. God has given us full redemption. He has accomplished it entirely, but we need to know how to apply it into our everyday life. I was in, on a mission trip in India not so long ago, uh, and we made our way across the border to Nepal. And there was some amazing things happening in Nepal. But we didn't have enough of that currency. And so I was entrusted with a bank card. But it wasn't my normal bank card. See, I, I prize myself on remembering. Um, I, I have a very good memory. I, I, I always know where I put certain things. And we have a little bit of a joke in our house as well about car keys. About what? <laughs> okay. Yeah, so I have a very good memory. I have a photographic memory. So we bought a calendar a couple of years ago. It was beautiful um, wood printings and one printing per month, and it was up in our fridge once. 
And when we were going, getting the cart with Sandy, it's the most beautiful cart. It, it's a Cana Canadian geese flying into the wind, into the, into the sky with a sunset or a sunrise coming up, which is why we bought it for you, Sandy. And I saw this card in Waterstones. And I said, Anna, that's the card on our calendar. And she said, what do you mean? I said, it's the card on our calendar. So we bought it, we took it home. And I don't know if it was a little bit of ego stroking or pride, but I was like, I brought the calendar out. He said, look, I got it right. You know, anyway, so I have a very good memory. We were in Nepal and I had a bank card. And I had to go and get money out of the, ca the cash machine to see us through that week's mission, right? I went to the cash machine. I put the card in, and I put my PIN number in. Do, 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 do. Beep. Wrong number. Like, hold on. I know my number. I have a good memory. I can choose a card from a calendar that I saw months, months ago. You know, I stuck the number in. Beep. Wrong number. And then it did this thing. It came up in Hindi on the screen. I don't know what it said. I was like, Lord, give me the gift of interpreting tongues right now. I pushed some buttons, made the worst noise you ever heard, beep, 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 brrr, and it ate my card. It ate my card. So what? I'm stuck in Nepal. Trevor's preaching in the meeting. I'm outside of the streets, like little guys going by on rickshaws. You know, I'm like, stay away from the ruts, guys. And I don't know what to do. I'm like, Lord Jesus, could you help me? I've got no money. I don't know where we're going to stay. We can't pay for food. We can't pay for hotels. What's going to happen? And just at that moment, a little ne Nepalese security guard walked around the corner. And he saw me like, I, I think I was pushing numbers in the machine. But I think I was probably bawling. And he, you know, he saw me. He knew I needed help. And, he, and he, we didn't speak English very well. I, I, sorry, he didn't speak English very well. I didn't speak any Nepalese. <laughs> Somehow I communicated that this machine had eaten my card. He ran, a, he ran around the corner. I thought, oh my, my word, Lord, what are you going to do? He ran back with a key. And this, this ATM is on the street. I mean, there's people going by. He opens the machine up. There's wadges of money just stuck in the side. I'm thinking, do I take a break and run right now? You know, is the God giving me a double portion? You know? I, it was a miracle. I've never seen anyone with authority to open an ATM machine. Normally, if it happens in England, they, you know, they send you to your bank and you have to fill out these forms. It's like, what's your NI number? I'm like, what's an NI number? Anna, where are you? What's your date of birth? Help, I don't know any of my paperwork. Anyway, he gave me my card back. I put it again, and here's what I realized. I had remembered my PIN code but it was for the different card. And whether it was jet lag, whether it was God wanted to give me a great message example, I don't know. Whether he wanted to humble me, I don't know. I then remembered, hang on, this is the wrong card. And I recalled the right pin number, put the card back in while the guy was watching me because he wanted to make sure he wasn't opening up to some you know, thief or something. I put the correct pin number in and what came out? <sighs> Sweet sustenance. <laughs> You see, there's a point I want to make, and the point is this. God has accomplished on the cross everything that we need for our daily Christian life. Hallelujah. God has accomplished freedom on your behalf. God has cleansed you from the, the iniquity, from sin, from the things that we've done wrong. He's cleansed us from the things even our parents and generations before us have gone wrong. His blood is sufficient. It's accomplished. He is redeemed. He has done it all. But we have to apply it to our lives. We have to know the pin code. And I'm going to tell you a secret. I know the pin code. Get your notebooks out. Write it down. Four digits. Are you ready? Remembering the blood of Jesus Christ. Remembering the body of Jesus Christ. We can apply the blood to our lives. And we do that by coming to the table. This is what we're doing this morning. It isn't just something that we do. Isn't it nice? Thank you, Jesus. On the cross. You're not on the cross because you died and you rose again. And I remember. And we go about our everyday life. We are bringing ourselves today. And we are partaking in an invitation. Will we apply the blood to our lives? I talked about Passover just briefly when Jesus was having this meal in Luke 22. What happened on the first Passover night? 
a lamb was slain, but he didn't just stay slain. They didn't just cook and eat it. They had to take the blood and they had to do what? They had to apply it to the doorway of your life. Today, friends, I feel that there is a new level of freedom that's going to come into our lives. I have a sense even of the presence of God coming into our lives like we've never known before because we haven't been on the road. Sometimes we, we've, we've been taking communion, but we've been falling into legalism. We've been doing it religiously. We, we've been done it, be, doing it because every once a month at church we do it, and no one's taking time to explain it, and, and we believe in Jesus on the cross, and we do it. There is a, there is a new level of life. The life of the blood of Jesus flowing through you. Not just a little, is this a thimble? I don't know what this is. This little plastic cup. You see, the, the Bible said, take this and divide it. This is the best way we can divide it right now amongst ourselves. The point I'm making is this. Jesus has accomplished our redemption, but it needs to be applied to our lives. You see, fellowship is not just one-sided. It has to be mutual. God calls, but we have to answer. The application of redemption begins with an effectual call from God where the Father ushers us into fellowship. But effectual calls must carry with them appropriate responses. And appropriate responses must exercise our hearts, our minds, and our wills. We're not coming this morning to the communion table and just exercising our heart only. We're not coming just the will. I'm going to come forward, eat it, and not engaging our spirits and our minds. We have to engage all of these together. This is one of the reasons why, as a church family here, we have such a high value on response. We love at the end of the meeting to invite people to come forward. Is there something special about this place? No. But what it does is it engages a response from us. There is a call that goes out, and we say it will not be left unanswered. So why, why a response? What, what's so important about this response? How do we actually respond? How do we remember what's forgotten? How, do we, how does communion make that link? On Thursday night, just gone, I want you to give a big hand for married couples in Revival Fires. Come on, lift it up. We had... Give them a big hand because we all need it. We need strong marriages we need to be strengthened we need each other but on Thursday night we had a marriage night it was such a joy just to spend time being really intentional and focused on pouring in to a wine skin for revival that's what it is that's what the family unit is but one of the things Anna said uh, on Thursday night which really just helped me think about this as we come to remembering one of the things that she said was to um, not just to say, I love you. And we did this exercise. We said, I love you because. And we had to put into words the reasons why we would love each other. And you know why it was so important? Because life happens and we have this thing called jobs or commitments or, or families or children, parents, grandparents, whatever it is. And in life, we have made a commitment of love to each other as a married couple, but we also have to do the dishes. Or take the bins out. Or do this big pile called the laundry. Come on, guys. Thank you, Jesus, for the washing machine. <laughs> you know, and then there's, there's these kind of roles and transactions that we have to go through. Good morning, Anna. How are you doing? I'm really well. How are you? I've put the coffee on. Great. I'm going to make the children's lunch. Are you taking them to school today or is it me? No, I've got this meeting. Okay, cool. I'll do that. Have you done the shopping at Aldi? No, Aldi was close today. I'm going to go to Little. What about that person needs a call? Yes, I've got it. Okay, I'll see you tonight. No, no problem. Bye. The door closes. Do you know what I'm talking about? Maybe you're not in a married couple. That's okay. Friendships, parents. This is life, isn't it? And so often we can say, I love you, see you, in the see you tonight, bye. And we don't have time to stop and to say, I love you because. And these are the reasons. You see, the point I'm trying to make here is that we have to remember and recall some of the reasons why we're in this relationship because things can get forgotten. And the context of this that we're about to join into together today is also the context of of a marriage feast. We've read together in Luke 22. Did you hear those words? Jesus said this, 
I will not eat again of the fruit of the vine until I come in my Father's kingdom. He said it again, I will not eat again of the bread until I come into my Father's kingdom. Those words, just, we just read through them religiously, you see, and we think, ah, oh, I don't know what it means, I'll just keep going. Those words were taken directly out of a, of a marriage ceremony called betrothal that happened in Jesus' time. So when Jesus says those very words to his disciples, his disciples' ears think, I know exactly what he's talking about. You see, what can also be forgotten sometimes is cultural relevance. And I want to just explain to you some of the cultural relevance of what we're about to do, what Jesus was communicating when he said this. You see, it's taken from a betrothal ceremony in Jesus' day. And let me just read to you what would happen at a betrothal ceremony because it's so rich in what God wants to do today. What would happen is a potential suitor, a potential bridegroom, would be sent to the bride's family by the father to live with the family, to, 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 to see how love would develop. Before they make a commitment, they would go and spend time in, with the bride and her family. During this time, the bridal price would be set with the father. So the fathers would talk and they'd say, hey, my son's getting on really well with your daughter. And they would set a bridal price. Yeah, she, she, this is a good relationship. This has got potential. I, I, think, I think that God is going to be pleased with this marriage. And this would begin a marriage covenant of betrothal. Have you read... Um, Joseph and Mary, I know we've come through Christmas, I know that was a couple months ago now, but Joseph and Mary, and while they were betrothed, Mary became pregnant, and it was a huge um, hit of shame upon Joseph, and Joseph wanted to secretly, the word, the Bible uses this word, divorce her, but they weren't even married yet, so what was he being divorced from? You see, betrothal in that cultural context was the same as being married, it was being married, it just wasn't finalized and that you weren't, it wasn't consummated and you weren't living together. So there was this covenant that was being set up. And after the, the bridal price was set and they'd lived together, here is how they would find out if they would say yes to the covenant. So it's kind of like a, a proposal. What would happen was um, the two families would come together and the groom would take a cup of wine and he would drink from it. And as he drunk from it, it represented everything the groom was. And the groom then would give it to the bride, who the one he was proposing to. And the bride would take the cup, and the bride then had a choice. Remember, I'm, the point I'm making is applied. How do we apply what's been accomplished at the cross for us? The bride would take the cup, and you'll be pleased to know this wasn't forced. The bride had a choice in the matter. She could decide, yes, I've lived with this young man. For, for a while now, and I love him, and I want to commit my life to him. I want to say yes to this marriage. She had the choice then. She could either drink the cup, which represented receiving everything that the groom was for her, and as she drank the cup, she was giving everything that she was to the groom. At this point, she was saying yes to him. She had the chance to accept it. Here's what acceptance meant. You know, if she didn't drink it, Basically, it was a bit disappointing because the groom would have to go and find another bride somewhere. And we have a choice. You see, God says, do this in remembrance of me as we come to drink a cup this morning. The cup that we're drinking is the acceptance that's saying we will be the bride of Christ. Here's the, the, the applications. As we drink the cup this morning, we say, I give myself fully to the groom. I give all that I am to the groom for all that he is. And who is our groom this morning? Jesus Christ. You see, at this point, they were legally married. And at this point, this is what's so amazing about it. At this point, the bride, um, I'm going to read you a couple of things, but she was married and she had the, the, the promise of everything that the groom would bring to her. So we stand right now. Jesus has come to the cross talking about the shadow and the reality. Here we stand and we get to drink of the cup. We say yes to Jesus. We get to live in the fullness of all of his kingdom right now. We can draw it. One day he will come a second time. And here's what happens in the ceremony. The groom would then return to the father's house. He would be happy. 
His, his bride said, yes. She drank the cup. The groom would return to the father's house and say these words, I am going to prepare a place for my bride. What did Jesus say after this supper in the Bible? He says, I'm going to prepare a place for you. In my father's house, there are many, many rooms. The groom would then pay the price for the bride that was set by the father. What was the price that was paid by Jesus Christ? He gave his very life on a cross for us. I want you to begin to see this. This isn't just, man, Ryan, I had a tough week. Things were difficult at work, and I thought things I shouldn't have thought. I did things I shouldn't have done, and I need God's cleansing. Come and cleanse me, God. That's what it is. But that's just a little bit of it. Get your, go to the bank of heaven today and receive the fullness of relationship that God has for you as we take the cup today. He is calling you into communion, relationship, fellowship, two-sided. He calls, I respond. The groom would pay the price. Jesus paid the price for us. The groom would then, get this, he would leave a gift for the bride to remember him by as he went to the father's house. This was also a down payment guaranteeing his return. Think about those words. What did he say? I will not leave you as orphans, but I will send a helper, the Holy Spirit. And what is the Holy Spirit called? He is the down payment of our inheritance. He is the one who guarantees. So even as you come and you take this cup, you are recognizing that, I am, that you are living in a time under the, the fullness, the reality of the Holy Spirit. Everything that will happen on that day, we can pull into today. The bride would call herself the temple for the groom. Think about that. We are now the temple of of the Holy Spirit. Two more things that would happen. The bride would place a lamp candle in the window burning at night to show the groom. You see, they were heart sick for each other. He couldn't wait the appointed time for the completement of the marriage. And he would walk past the house like, is she, is she there? Is she in the window? Make sure you close the window when you get changed, baby. You know, is she, is she there in the window? And she had left a candle burning. Think about the parable of the wise virgins. Will you keep the lamp burning while you wait for God to come? That's what we do when we come to take communion. We say, God, you've accomplished it, but I'm not just leaving it somewhere out there. I want to apply this to my life. I am saying, yes, I am your bride. I'm not just saying, yes, your blood is enough to forgive you my sins. I'm saying, yes, your blood is enough to transform me from the inside so I live differently. Are you getting this this morning, church? The final thing that would happen at this betrothal ceremony is the father then would set, send for the groom for the wedding at the appointed time. But who would set the appointed date? It wasn't the groom. It was the father. What does Jesus say? I do not know the hour when I will come again. My father knows the hour. It's just so rich. This is the, when we understand the cultural context, we, we're brought face to face with the reality of what God has done for us. This is why Jesus says he doesn't know the time of his coming. But the second coming, what will it be when he comes again? A wedding feast. A feast where we, the church, individuals, corporately, are the bride for Jesus who have said we have kept ourselves pure. We have kept ourselves living a life, uh, talking of your kingdom, and we love you, and we come into your presence. So let's move aside just the shallowness that we can do in religion when we come to commune have eat communion with the Lord. So what are some of the things we need to remember? Here's what I believe, even as we take it. We're going to be remembering our first love. Book of Revelations chapter 2. You know this verse, but let me read it to you. It says this, Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how high and how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. As I used that example that Anna is talking about on Thursday night, when we come together and we say, I love you because, and we remember the vows, the covenants, the words that we said over each other on our marriage day, when things get difficult, we can look back at that and say, that is what I'm standing on. That is the truth of this love. And God calls to us as well, come and partake in my first love again. I can't get away. I don't think I've been able to preach a message this year yet without quoting Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven, And I want to quote it because here's what, it's Jesus talking. 
And a Pharisee comes to him. And what does a Pharisee represent? It represents the religious leaders, religious authority. It represents legalism. And it was someone who was caught in a rut on the road of relationship. And he says to Jesus, really, you can hear the cry of his heart. He's trying to get right with God. And he says, what is the greatest of all commandments? And Jesus sums it up so beautifully. He says this, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. All of the prophets hang on these two commandments. What we're doing today when you come and you take communion is you're saying, Lord, I am remembering your invitation to me. I am remembering that you are my bridegroom. And I am saying yes, and I am coming back to first love. This is the very thing that can be applied to your life, that can awaken forgotten parts of our hearts. God doesn't want you to live dry. God doesn't want you to live crusty. God doesn't want you to live weary. God wants you to live in the love that he's given for you. So straight from that verse in Matthew 22, there are some signs in our lives that we can be living out of alignment of the first love commandment. And this is something when I read it um, in January, I just keep going back to this chapter in a book. It's a great book by Michael Miller. And I keep going back and reading these bits over and over again because it's the best way to align my life. And I want to share it with you because allow the Holy Spirit to move in you. If some of these areas that I'm talking about are you, this is what the communion table is for today. This is what we can respond to. These are signs that we're living out of our first love commandment. Fear of man is greater than the fear of God. Times in our lives where we, we're fearing what other people would think, what other people would say more than we think about and focus about what does God think of us. We begin to focus on people above the presence of God. You see, the first command is love the Lord your God and then love others. But what we do when we get it all flipped around is that we try to love people first and we forget our ministry to the Lord. We forget our calling of loving God. We forget the call that every morning when you awake and he is there saying, my child, come spend time with me. My child, I've got living water for you for today. And what we do is we live presence over people. Sorry, we live people over presence. And God is saying, come back. Even when you take communion, come to my presence. It's the greatest call. We seek influence over intimacy. Let me tell you, as a church leader, that's a big one. Lord Jesus, would you keep us as a people who seeks your presence, who seeks intimacy above influence. Influence is important, let me tell you. But if it's for the sake of influence, we'll get into dangerous places where love is not active. The earthly, the physical, or the visible realm is of greater importance than the heavenly, spiritual, or invisible realm. You know, we could have missed what God is doing for us today if, if some of you didn't come up here and prophesy, if the worship leader didn't flow in the new song, if we didn't move with what God wants. Let's continue to align ourselves, take, go into the place of applying the blood when we live from heaven to earth. That's the order, not earth to heaven. We find greater fulfillment in leading men than in following Jesus. Many things have our intention instead of the one thing capturing our attention. We can be so concerned about all the different things. I know I used that analogy, getting, us, getting out of the house in the morning. You know, have you done the shopping? Have you put the bins up? I'm gonna do this, will you do that? There's so many things that require our attention and they don't go away. You know this, they never stop. What do we do? We don't, we don't choose God. We don't come to the table and say, Lord, I'm made for communion with you and ignore all the things. They still have to happen, but we put him first in our lives. We value the presence above presentation. We worry, the worry of work outweighs the wonder of his words and his will. Have you, you remembered Mary and Martha? She was so worried about work. And I'm not just talking about the nine to five job, but about the, the, the effectual ministry to people. Will it be seen? Will it be, will it be noticed? Will it be right? We worry about that weight of worry calls us down. Instead of saying, Lord, I put weight on your will. What is your will for my life today? I put weight on your words. What are your words today? And the final point, um, I, I could say more about this, but we're running out of time. I need to get this point to you. The final point, how do we apply it? It's thanksgiving. There was no 
preaching license that I told you to tell the person next to you Thanksgiving when we read it in the Bible because he says it three times. You know, every single time that the communion supper is talked about in the word of God, it's Thanksgiving is used. One of the words that we can use for it in the church is the Eucharist. I know, a big fancy word. It literally means Thanksgiving, the Thanksgiving meal. If we are going to shift into what God wants for our lives, if we're going to apply it, if we're going to move from forgotten things to remember things, if we're going to remember God, let's take him up on this instruction of thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is the powerful key to remembering what we have. So often we're very good, even in our prayers, of praying for the things we don't have yet. Is it just me? Sometimes we're so good at even talking with our friends and and our family about the things that we haven't got yet. And we forget to give thanks for what he has done in our lives. You know the word, the scripture in Revelation that says this. I'm just going to get it right. Sometimes I misquote it. It says this. They overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. And the spirit of prophecy, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Let me tell you, it's impossible for you to be miserable if you continue to thank God for what he has done for you in the past. Yes. Come on, I heard a clap in that one. Come on. It's impossible for you to be miserable if you come and start to give thanks for what God has done. Testimony is the power to remember it. And as you remember it, you're even recalling what God will do in your future. I want you to be a people of thankfulness. Not because it makes anyone look good or sound good, but because God has given this as a principle and a key for us to approach Him. Let me tell you what I'm talking about. Psalm 100 verse 4. Enter His gates with thanksgiving, His courts with praise. Be thankful unto Him. Bless His name. There is a richness that we come to, to partake of this morning. But if we're coming in legalism, if we're coming with liberalism, if we're coming with all of the things we've been through, and we're not saying, Lord, thank you for your blood. If there's one thing you do today, you say thank you. And you, you allow the, the reality of what he's done for you on the cross for you personally, it will transform your life. It will lead you into first love. Revelation 9, whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to him who sits on the throne, the elders fall down, and they cast their crowns before him, and they worship. Things will begin to shift in our lives when we come with thanksgiving. Paul Paul instructs us in Ephesians 5, speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music in your heart, always, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything In the name of Jesus Christ. Try it. Lord, we come this morning and we say thank you. And what I've talked about, things that are lost, things that are forgotten. Here's what I believe God wants to release. There are things that are stolen in your lives that are coming back in Jesus' name. Because we have learned how to apply his fullness on the cross for our lives. Let me just, in the Exodus Passover narrative. Here's the things that were stolen over the lives of God's people that he is going to be restoring today. There were stolen wages, generations after generation of slavery and not being paid for. In a a day after the Passover, they... As God's people left Egypt, they gave them all their jewelry. They gave them all their gold. They gave them all their possessions. It wasn't that they were plundering them. It's that they were repaying them for all of their years of of slavery. God is going to return stolen wages. God is going to return stolen inheritances in Jesus' name. I feel that this morning. There was a stolen future. When you are a slave and you wake up every morning, you can't make future plans for yourself. You can't plan for your children. And I want you to know, just in a room this size, even people watching online, that there are people today that you feel as though your future has been stolen. It's been stolen by the enemy. It might have been stolen. It might have been stolen by... by, um, Things that our parents have done or decisions that have been made even on the past. It might have been stolen because you're living in a different country where you don't have the same uh, access to things. But today, as you come to the cross, you're saying, Jesus, would you redeem what has been stolen? There is a future for you. There is a hope for you. There is a destiny for you. You can begin to dream again. Dreams are being awakened today. When you come at the cross and you say, God, they might not be my dreams, but they're your dreams for my life. 
Jesus eagerly desires to share this with you today. Your ability to choose uh, uh, and um, even stolen control, we can surrender to God. There was a loss of land. It was returned again. You know, God's people didn't just leave a land behind. They went to a place. May this place, this spiritual ground, be a promised land for you today. May this be a place where you step into the blessing, the provision, and the love of God. This one, stolen health and energy. I want you to know that by His stripes, you were healed. It says in Isaiah 53, let me read this. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, by his stripes, by the lashes that he took, we are healed. You might be here today and you've been struggling with sickness. I want you to know it could be something as simple as a headache. God can set you free. He has healing available. He has accomplished it on the cross. We apply it today. It might be cancer. You've heard testimony in the start of this year of a precious lady whose cancer was totally removed from her body. What was more than that, she wasn't able to have children. And not only was she cancer free, she was pregnant. (laughs) Hallelujah. Give him thanks. Thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. We recognize what you're doing. What about you? I just have a sense right now, even as I'm looking out, that there's knee problems, that there's joint problems. And by his stripes, his blood has fallen upon us. Um, the ground and it cries out it speaks a better word and it's available for us today whatever is stolen we say no more in Jesus name we get to receive it we get to to partake of it I want to invite Jude would you come on up this morning what's been lost is being found what's been forgotten is being remembered and what's been stolen is being restored today as we come and say Thank you, Jesus. Would you all stand up with me? I want to instruct us on how we're going to receive this today. And it might be a little bit different, but that's okay. God's allowed to do new things, isn't he? Now, before we do this, there is one requirement before we come to take the the blood of Jesus. And it is this. It's salvation. If you're going to take of his blood, you have to have given your life to him. He gave his life hung up on a cross, died on a tree so that he could redeem you. And this this wonderful to see friends, to see new people, to see visitors. But I want to give you an invitation, even as Jesus gave us an invitation this morning, to come and to partake of his blood and his bread and communion. I want to give you an invitation first. If you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, if you've never said, I believe in you. Sometimes we can get caught up about it as being a Christian. Yes, it is being a Christian, but do you know what the Bible says happens in moments like this? You are born again. What actually happens in moments like this is that parts of you that were dead, parts of you that you feel lost in, they come to life as you give your life to Jesus Christ. And I just simply want to ask, If you would like to give your life to Jesus today, just lift your hands up. I don't want you to be afraid. I don't want you to be um, discouraged. Lift them up really high so we can see. Because I want everyone in this place to partake of this meal today. Okay, that's fantastic. Fantastic. We're all ready to be welcomed into the table this morning. Isn't that good? Here's what I want you to do. In a minute, come on down to the front purposefully I'm not giving you the bread and the wine because you're coming to the cross of Jesus Christ you're coming yourself you're coming with an eyes opened remembering how amazing it is what he's done for you and I want you to take a cup and I want you to take a a bread that represents his body and you can go back to your seats if you want but at the end of this ministry team we're going to be moving amongst you once we've taken it together we're going to take it as one because we're a body so hold on to it until I give you the instructions so that we can do it together. And Jude's also going to lead us in a song that I've asked her to sing because it just outlines so well. So we're going to sing the song first, then we're going to come and and take communion. And if you are responding for healing, stay at the front. If you're responding to see things begin to shift in your life, stay at your front. If you've been feeling and sensing that first love, 
that maybe it just grows weary. Maybe the joy of your salvation grows weary. Maybe that childlike faith grows weary. Maybe you find yourself losing the wonder of, of the life that He's called you to. Stay at the front. And as one, as a body here, we're going to enjoy communion together. And we're going to minister to one another. So let's just sing this song. I think it outlines so well. It's called, uh, Thank You, Jesus, for the Blood Applied. If you could put it on the words too, please. I was a wretch. I remember who I was. I was lost. I was blind. I was running out of time. You separated. The reach was far too wide. From the far side of the chasm. Let's sing that chorus. Thank you, Jesus. Stick the words up, please. Thank you, Jesus, for the blood apply. Thank you, Jesus, you have saved me wide. Thank you, Jesus, you have saved my life. Brought me out of darkness. One more time. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. It has gone. Yes, it has gone. Thank you, Jesus. You have saved my life. Brought me from the darkness into Thank you, Jesus. I want to invite you to come on down, take a cup, take a bread, stay here at the front and hold on to it because as a body, we're going to take it together. So come on down, come and get yourself ready. Even as you make that journey, see yourself walking to your bridegroom, Jesus. See yourself saying yes to first love again. See yourself coming to a place where the things that are lost, they are going to get restored in Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. That's it. Take it and move. Move to a place. Move to the side. His presence is here this morning. He wants nothing more than a people who respond to Him. You know that you fill His heart with joy. Do you know that, friends? You fill His heart with joy as you come. As you get yourself ready. Yeah. Just, just keep, keep your eyes closed. I find that so helpful with distractions. You know, sometimes we, we can be in the flow of something and the enemy can... If our eyes are open, we, we can be distracted and we can lose the flow. But God's presence is here this morning. It's not awkward. It's beautiful. It's beautiful, Jesus. There's a table in the middle here as well. If you want to come to the middle, there's lots. There's enough for everybody. You did it for me, Jesus. You did it for me, Jesus. Yeah, you did it for me, Jesus. Just say thank you. Just put the word thank you on your lips. From your heart, from the depths of your heart this morning, we say thank you, Jesus. We say thank you. We remember, we recognize, we discern it, God. We discern what you've done. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. Okay. And Jesus took the bread and he gave thanks and he broke it. 
And he said to them, just as I'm saying to you this morning, this is the body of Jesus. It's given to you. Do this in remembrance of eat. So take it and eat it. We receive the bread of life this morning, God. We receive you as the manna, the bread of heaven, God. We receive you as the one who restores us, God, the one who brings first love alive. Blow on coals this morning, Jesus. Blow on coals this morning, Jesus. Fan into flame. We say yes to you, God. And now let's take the blood. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood which is poured out for you. Take it and drink it as one. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And I just want to release God as we've remembered you as we've applied what you've won for us at the cross. I release the triumph of your victory over every life this morning, God. I release things that are forgotten to come into remembrance right now in Jesus' name. I release things that are stolen to be given up right now by the enemy in Jesus' name. I release, Lord, that a sevenfold blessing of health in Jesus' name. I release the floodgates of heaven for the resources and the blessing for a future. I say, you have a hope. You have a future. You have a destiny. You can dream again. Lord, there is a supernatural, a spiritual exchange that happens this morning. Even as we put ourselves under your covenant again, we thank you for the life that you're pouring into our bodies, God. Thank you, Jesus. Just stay at the front here, ministry team. Move amongst this body of church here, this beautiful body of Christ. Begin to lay hands on your shoulders. Jude's going to just keep singing this song, it's a, the words of the song. Just sing it and worship to God. And let's just allow the Holy Spirit to minister. Don't rush away. Don't rush away. Don't worry about the cups. They can fall on the ground. They're just plastic. Just leave them where you are. Don't worry about them. Just let His presence touch you this morning. Yes, God. Thank you, Jesus. So you made a way across the great divide.
to breathe upon them. And people are going to start to see him and you're going to say some joy and just step into the things that he's done for you, the things he's made for you. God bless them in his life, Jesus. Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Just stay in this place. He's ministering. I know that kids are coming back in. But what an opportunity we have for children to come into this presence. Don't rush away. I just want to... Naga's going to just share a quick testimony. So he does... He wants me to share it. His child, Zion, was feeling sick. Uh, and they'd given him all the medicine that they needed to give him. And they do commune in their home most days. And Zion came to him last night and said, uh, this week, and said, Dad, I'm still sick, but I know if you give me communion now, I will be better. And you shared communion that night, and what happened? The next morning, he was okay. He was completely fine. There was no headache. There was no temperature. And he was off to school. Come on. Thank you, Jesus. So, if... Yeah, so keep, keep doing this. What we do on a Sunday, you know, the Bible says, be imitators of me. Paul says, be imitators of me. This isn't just about an hour to hear my voice. This is about uh, time for you to catch something. Put this in place in your families. Put this in place with your children. But on that testimony as well, if you want healing, come forward right now. We want to pray for healing. There is healing in this room. Things that are lost are being redeemed. I see knees getting healed. Who's the person with knees? Wave at me if there's a knee. Okay, I'll, I'll come to you. I'll come to you. Jesus' name. Lord, we speak to these, he to these knees. And we speak to joints, even as it says that every joint should supply life. That the joints should come together, bone to bone, ligament to ligament, and joints should supply life. We speak to whatever's blocking life in these joints. In Jesus' name, we tell you to go right now. And we release healing. I speak the life and the flow of the Holy Spirit on these knees, that they would be connected with flow, that pain would go, and that life would be restored in Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.
Put your hands on your, on your hearts this morning. Lord, I thank you for the first love that you're calling us into. I thank you for your blood that was shed, that was spilt. And now we, I ask for your blessing upon everyone, even that you would send us out this week to be a source of life to our families, our workplaces, our neighborhoods, our streets. And I ask for you to bless them in the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. Give God a hand this morning. Give Him a hand. We love your presence, God. If you still want to stay here, do stay. The ministry team will pray for you. But let's go and have a, a meal of thankfulness for Sandy in the coffee shop. Don't forget as well, heart to heart. If you're a visitor and you want to know more about the vision of the church and how you can belong here. Because this is a promised land for you.